Hi everybody, it's Professor Miller. This lecture is going to cover skin, hair, and nail assessment, and it's going to be covering more of the normals um, or normal variations. I'm going to try to move through it pretty quick so that way you're not listening to me for hours on end. Um, so you often will hear the term tissue integrity. A lot of times, like when you start learning about nursing diagnoses, um, will like one would, for instance, would be like impaired tissue integrity or so that term you might hear frequently within nursing, like when you're developing care plans. So integrity essentially is making, you know, looking at the skin and making sure it's intact and undamaged. So, you know, any alteration in tissue integrity might be like a lesion or an abrasion or, you know, all those abnormals. The important concept to understand, too, with tissue integrity is that our skin, number one, it's the largest organ of our body, and it's um, affected by multiple um, systems, essentially. So you really have to look at the skin as... Um, a great assessment tool to look at other, um, you know, to think about other assessment areas or other findings that may be going on with your patient. Um, and it's really affected by a lot of um, other areas. So you really have to think about perfusion, because um, if you don't have good perfusion, that's going to affect oxygenation. If you don't have good oxygenation, that's going to affect um, tissue healing. If um, you don't have good nutrition, that's going to affect healing as well. Or even if you think about like diabetes um, or malnutrition, it all has an effect on um, your skin essentially. Um, your tissue integrity also has um, an effect on your perception, like um, that might be like pain perception or alteration in um, sensation. And we'll kind of move through this as you um, look through the slides. Now, a health history, like we mentioned at the very beginning, a health history is either a focused history or it's a comprehensive history. And we'll kind of go into this when we talk about history taking. Um, but some subjective data, remember what subjective is. Subjective is basically things that you can't essentially verify, and it's more of like the patient complaint. This is um, objective is, remember, it's observable, and we can measure it essentially. Um, so you always want to ask your patient, do they notice any changes with their, their skin, hair, or nails? Um, do they have any alterations in sensation? And Because a lot of this will clue you into other areas or other systems um, or potential problems that could be going on with the patient. Have you ever had any um, problems with your skin, like skin diseases or infections? This might be like eczema or psoriasis. Or do they? another big one, too, that we always think about is like a MRSA infection. If they ever had... Um, you know, like a post-op complication of having MRSA. And actually, community-acquired MRSA is actually more um, problematic these days, um, and it can even happen in healthy individuals. Um, asking about how they keep their skin healthy, a lot of this is, um, you know, and we'll talk about changes with moles, the skin, um, and, you know, do they wear sunscreen, things like that. Um, so that's an area of health promotion. You'll see the term health promotion. Um, I'll, I'll say it frequently within the course because I try to tie in health promotion through different systems. Um, so making sure that your patient is wearing sunscreen, um, you know, on those areas that are always um, exposed to sun. Another thing, too, is thinking about certain medications. They can have that sensitivity to um, or the sun. It can actually cause that um, they can get burned easier from certain medications. Um, do a patient have a history of allergies? Um, have they had a history of hives? The thing, too, with allergies, like if they have, let's say, for instance, especially in pediatrics, if a patient has a significant history of allergies, like a peanut allergy, it's not always the case, um, but allergies, asthma, and eczema go hand in hand. Well, those three are very highly linked. So, like, a lot of times if you have a patient or, like, a child that has eczema, a lot of times these kids will have... Um, you know, other allergies and sometimes even asthma. That's why I bring up the point about asthma or eczema because those are always, the three are kind of linked. Um, so with rashes, it's always important. This is the thing. This is how you have to start thinking too. You have to think outside of the box. Don't just look at a rash and say, oh, wow, that's a macula or a papula or a pustule. Look at the bigger picture. So you really have to think about, okay, they present with a rash does this patient have their immunizations? Because it could be an infectious process. You know, it's nowadays, unfortunately, there's, you know, a lot of children that aren't vaccinated or even adults, um, you know, they're not up to date. So you really got to think about, do they have their immunizations? Have they had a recent illness? A lot of viral illnesses can be linked with um, skin rashes. And um, another question I always ask is, like, have they traveled recently? Because um, certain areas that they travel to can cause other infections. You always think about medications. 
So if someone has a rash that's like kind of all over the body, you know, ask your patient, did they, did you start a new medication? Is this something new um, that you've just recently begun taking? Or, um, you know, ask if they have itching with it, which is um, pruritus. Pruritus means itching. So these are questions that you really got to start thinking about and tying in with your exam. So don't think of your physical exam or viewing the skin as a separate thing. You need to put all of this information together. Um, another question too is asking, do they have a fever or have they, you know, have they had a fever recently? Because you have to make sure that it's not an infectious process essentially. You always ask, how did it start with skin lesions? When did it start? Did it start as a simple red area or did it start like a pustule and then turn into, you know, a larger area with a crust? Because it'll tell you a lot about, you know, you know, I guess it'll tell you a lot about what is possibly going on. And it's not your job to diagnose, but um, honestly, being a knowledgeable nurse is, um, I mean, that's what you, that's what it takes to be a good, good nurse. And honestly, that's what we're going to work on. I want you to think about all of these factors and kind of tying it in together. You always ask about pruritus, which is itching. That's the term for itching, so become familiar with these terms. Um, itching is actually considered a form of pain, um, but itching can be associated with um, certain states. Like if it's an allergic reaction, sometimes you'll see itching with it, and um, or versus like if it was a painful rash, like herpes zoster, will they have a painful rash? And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we look through some of the abnormals. So an assessment, once again, you always begin with inspection. Um, so that begins as soon as you walk in that room. Look at your patient's face. Look at their skin, you know, like they're by their eyes. Um, look at their neck. Look at their hands. Just kind of do that general survey right when you walk in. Um, compare symmetrically. You always want to look at both sides. Like, for instance, this was like an IV infiltration. Um, I mentioned this within another lecture, but you can't really tell it. This is, you know, generalized swelling. You know, you might not even know that the IV was out if you just looked at that hand. Now, if you look at both her hands, you can see the, the difference there. Same thing with legs. This is obviously very obvious, but let's say, for instance, this patient didn't have all that redness. They only had one side, um, and it was just puffy without the redness. That might just be normal edema for the patient, but you really have to look at both sides, and it's, you know, it's important to start um, doing that or taking that approach. In terms of palpation, I'll talk about this in another few slides. We'll go through that. Um, you always are going to inspect the skin when you're doing your other system. So if you're doing, you know, your head, face, neck exam, you're going to inspect the skin when you're doing it. When you're doing the lungs, you're going to look at the skin when you do it. And, um, you know, make sure that you have adequate lighting and privacy for your patient. Um, you know, like make sure you, um, you know, give them a drape to put over or a blanket or, um, you know, or just closing um, the curtain for the patient as well. So like I said, inspection, note the general color, look at the uniformity of color, and, um, you know, do they have a mottled look? Sometimes mottling will look like, um, or is related to, like, perfusion issues. Um, or, like, if you're, you'll see this very frequently, like, they might have a darker pigmentation on their lower extremities. And it almost looks like this, um, like, almost like, uh, like multiple freckles being all in one area at the lower, on the lower extremities. I'll show you a picture at the end, but... It's related to venous insufficiency, so that's very common. You'll see that a lot in older adults. So looking at the color of their skin, um, you want to inspect exposed and unexposed areas because like um, we talked about in class, you can find things that patients aren't even aware of. Assess for odor. Odor is a high indicator for infection. Um, so if there was a wound, for instance, or you were changing a dressing on a surgical site and there's an odor there, um, that's definitely a red flag as, um, you know, looking at possibility of infection. Um, assess for lesions. Um, we'll go through lesions in another um, uh, lecture. Skin color can range from anywhere from whitish pink to olive tones to deep brown. So obviously, depending on the patient's ethnicity um, and just their, their normal, that, you know, that might be normal for them. They might look sort of pale. Um, but that's why it's important too, with, um, you know, to look at their mucous membranes, like the, the conjunctiva, because, you know, their skin might look pale and that just might be their normal. So you really got to think about stuff like that. Hair distribution, um, that is also linked with other systemic diseases. So 
for instance, with vascular disease, um, sometimes patients like may have a little bit of hair loss or they may not have much hair on their lower extremities if they have like peripheral vascular disease. And a lot of times like their skinny may be, or their skin may be shiny or taut with it. Um, so you got to look at um, their hair. And then even like the hair distribution on the head, a lot of times that can be related to like hypothyroidism or, you know, areas like that. So normal skin variation, um, nevi, which are, is the term for moles, and this essentially is melanocytes that grow into clusters. Um, so a lot of people have moles, and uh, some people have more than others. Um, and freckles, um, obviously freckles you probably have all seen before. It's a collection of melanin in the skin. Patches are another common finding that you'll see, and these are birthmarks. Um, and sometimes they'll, they'll be like those more of a flat, macule, um, brown area, and it's just a patch, or sometimes you'll see a straw, they call it strawberry hemangiomas, it's a collection of red blood vessels. It's common in peds, but a lot of times as they get older, they actually um, like reabsorb and they shrink, and um, usually they don't really have much of a lesion thereafter. So believe it or not, you know, as they get older, a lot of times they go away. Um, stry are, is the other term for um, stretch marks, and that's essentially when they get the stretching of the skin and then tearing of that um, the epidermis, essentially. So when you're palpating the skin, this is one of those key things to remember. Use the dorsum of your hand. So that's the other term, dorsal versus ventral. Dorsum of your hand is basically using the back of your hand, not your palm, the back of your hand. And this is what we use to assess temperature. So if you, um, for instance, you're looking at somebody's leg and you're concerned about redness or swelling or warmth, you want to, you know, feel it essentially to make sure that it doesn't feel warm. Well, normal skin is warm, but you don't want it to feel hot. Um, and it's normal to have hands or feet maybe a little bit cooler. Just, just That's just usually related to like um, circulatory issues. But if it's significant, then that's something to look at. Um, you're going to use light palpation to assess skin moisture. So, you know, skin should be dry, essentially. I mean, they, depending on, um, you know, the patient's current state. You're looking for diaphoresis, which is um, essentially like excess sweating. So that's the term for sweating, essentially, is diaphoresis. You may see that with a, um, an acute MI or angina. Um, cool or moist, like sometimes that would be, like I said, it's more related to like a perfusion issue. Or if the um, patient had a temperature or a fever, sometimes they feel that they might feel cool. Um, not cool, they might feel clammy with it. That's where you would get the moist. So palpation, if you're, like I said, light palpation, you're going to look at um, like the, the surface of the um, tissue, the texture of it. It should feel smooth and soft. Um, exposed skin, obviously, is not as soft. So like if you're looking at somebody's elbows or their hands in the winter, obviously, they're going to be a little bit more dry. Um, as you age, uh, you know, a lot of times you have changes with your skin, like decreased elasticity and stuff like that. So, you know, that's normal aging, essentially. A test that we do for mobility and skin turgor. So that is basically what you do is you're pinching an area of skin and you're looking for like skin tenting essentially. And I have another picture in another, I think it's in a different lecture, but um, typically you can do it below the clavicle, but we also do it on like the dorsal, the dorsal surface of the hand. Um, but it should basically return back to that um, immediate place. It should lie flat again. If you do have tenting, meaning that like you pinch the skin and it kind of stays up like that, um, that's an indicator for dehydration. Sometimes it's seen with significant weight loss just because they have um, like a real quick loss of fatty tissue in the area. So, um, but we do, so this is what we do. We check for um, uh, tenting essentially for mobility and turgor. So skin turgor is something that you got to remember. Edema, um, so what is edema? Edema is essentially accumulation in the interstitial space. So this is when fluid is moving out of the vascular space into the interstitial space, meaning into the tissue. Edema is associated with multiple things. Um, it can be edema from, you know, you can, they could have edema all over the body, they could have edema on the lower extremities on both sides, or they could have it on one side. You really have to put it within the context of the clinical picture. So. For instance, if it's one leg versus both legs, that's something to think about. If it's both legs, um, you know, that leads you to believe that it might be something like CHF or just dependent edema if the patient had fluid overload. 
Um, if it's on one side, that's more of a red flag because they're going to have, if it's like, let's say it's one lower extremity um, and it's red or warm, that's um, an indicator that there could possibly be like cellulitis going on or an infection going on or um, something like a DVT. So you really have to look at edema as to where it's presenting, um, all their symptoms that could be going on. Do they have a fever? Do they have, um, you know, any changes with their heart sounds? I mean, it's multiple. We'll kind of work on this as we look at some um, case studies. So what we do to check for edema is we basically do look for pitting. So what you're doing is you're using um, your finger or your thumb, essentially, and you're pushing in on, on the surface of the skin. And I'll show you the next page. But And then we label it as pitting, edema, like, you know, mild pitting, moderate pitting, deep pitting, very, very deep pitting. So one to two to three to four. And I'll kind of look at this as we move through, but um, mild pitting is, they're going to have like a very slight indentation. For instance, like if we were um, on your feet all day and you were to press on your, um, you know, your shin or your lower extremity with your thumb, you might have a small indentation. And that's kind of normal, to be honest. It just depends on what your, the patient was doing or if they're standing a lot or um, if they have a diet high in sodium. Um, but usually with this case, these patients don't even really realize they have it. Um, Number or two plus is moderate pitting. So you'll push in and then this indentation will actually basically disappear within, you know, a couple minutes and it won't be there. Now, when you're getting into like deep pitting edema, it would be like a three plus. So you'll have this indentation there for a short time and the leg actually will look swell like swelled up at this point in time. Um, you know, four plus is very deep um, pitting edema. It's going to last a long time and the legs are going to look very swollen. So, you know, typically, like, if you have a patient with edema, it's going to be like a, um, you know, two if it's very mild, three if it's, or I'm sorry, one to two if it's mild, and then I would say three is like when you're starting to get more of that deep pitting edema, and I'll show you on the next slide. This would be like a deep pitting. See how they push down, um, you're pushing down on the tissue, and there's so much fluid in there. Um, that it actually, like that skin, will leave an indentation like this. So we're checking for pitting edema with this. Now, there's other types of edema as well. Um, sometimes patients will have edema. I'll, I'll show you in the next slide. They'll have edema throughout the body. It'll be like a generalized edema. Another term you'll hear is periorbital edema. Sometimes you'll see this like, essentially, it's by the eyes. Peri, remember, peri means around. Orbital would be by the eyes. So sometimes you'll see this with cellulitis of the eye or some kind of infection, or even if the patient had surgery of the eye, they are, they're going to have periorbital edema from it. Um, now babies, babies always, honestly, when they're born, they typically have a little bit of swelling, um, you know, generalized as, and then their kidneys kind of start kicking in and then, um, usually that swelling goes away. Now, um, anascaria, basically this is edema over the entire body. So a lot of times this is related to like kidney failure. So kidney failure, they're not, um, they're not going to have the great out, essentially great output, um, or excretion. Um, sometimes you'll see it too with, um, you know, uh, with heart failure, but like I, this would be very, very late stage heart failure because heart failure, you usually will see, we'll talk about this when we get to heart, but, um, it's either right side of heart failure or left sided heart failure. So usually it'll be more symptoms of, um, on the lungs or, or on the legs. When they start getting it throughout the body, this is usually when the patient, um, has a severe medical issue going on at this point. Um, and it may be like sepsis or kidney fail, like multi-organ um, um, system failure. So when you see this, it's usually the patient's very ill at this point in time. Another type of edema, and this is non-pitting edema. So you have pitting edema and non-pitting edema. So non-pitting edema, you're not going to get that, um, that indentation when you press on their extremity. You'll see non-pitting edema a lot with lymph edema. So lymph edema is typically associated after um, lymph nodes are excised. You'll see this a lot with breast cancer. For instance, like this patient, um, she may have had a mastectomy and a lumpectomy, or a, um, and they, a lot of times will remove lymph nodes. If it's in the lymph nodes, they're going to remove them, and um, sometimes they remove others just to test them as well. Well, if, if you think about it, if you remove lymph nodes, that's what's facilitating drainage. So they're, they're going to end up with this, like, edema in their extremity. I've seen it a lot, too, with, not a lot, but um, I've had a few patients that have had, like, osteosarcoma, 
uh, in the, the, the thigh, essentially in the quad or into the femur. Now with this, the same type of thing, they re end up removing lymph nodes, lymph nodes in the groin. So we got to remember lymph nodes will facilitate um, uh, drainage and kind of, and, and it would be pumping things back up um, essentially to, to bring it back into circulation. Um, but if you're removing lymph nodes, these patients can end up with, um, you know, swelling in that extremity. And it's actually, it's problematic. Sometimes they'll use sleeves, more of like a compression sleeve to help relieve some of the edema with it. Or there's even physical therapy that we do with it. Um, so there's, you know, some different routes that we can do to treat this. Assessment of hair. So I always start with um, inspection. Um, look at distribution. And, um, you know, obviously, as people age, um, like in men, there's going to be normal hair loss um, in that male um, pattern hair loss, essentially. Um, but like I said, like if you're looking for hair and you're looking at the distribution, um, you're looking at the scalp, so you're looking at the skin of, on your head. Um, you always got to look for lesions, you know, because sometimes people actually will have um, abnormal moles on their, their skin on their head because, um, you know, obviously you get sun exposure there too, so that's an, always an area to look at. Infestations, unfortunately, there are times where you'll have patients that have um, lice, essentially, so, you know, looking to make sure that there's nothing in the hair, on the shafts of the hair, or on the scalp. You're going to look at hair texture. So the hair should be normally soft. It shouldn't be excessively dry or brittle or anything like that. Because sometimes that's linked with nutritional deficiencies. Um, it can be linked with your thyroid. You want to feel the scalp for smoothness, intactness, and tenderness. Um, so it should feel smooth, and you shouldn't have lesions, and it shouldn't be tender. Um, and you do have, like, your occipital nodes, like, towards the back or the base of your skull. Um, they, you might be able to feel them very faintly, but they shouldn't be significantly enlarged or anything like that. So it should be non-tender. Quick anatomy of the nails. Um, so it's basically epidermal cells converted to keratin plates. Um, your nails are very vascular, so a lot of times, like, if a patient has an injury um, to their finger or they get smashed, they can get those hematomas under there. And I believe I mentioned another um, PowerPoint, but they're usually very painful. Sometimes they get um, so much pressure built up on there that they actually will um, do like a small release on there and they'll put like a little tiny little opening to kind of relieve the pressure under the nail. Um, the thing too to recognize with nail, and this kind of goes on with your nails, hair, and skin, is that it goes along with systemic disease. There's certain systemic diseases that are linked with nail changes and we'll kind of look at those real quick. So you want to look at the general overall color of the nails. Um, you know, obviously it's going to vary between um, ethnicity. So, you know, that might be their normal for them. So you got to just look at the, um, you know, like compared to the other skin as well. One area that we always look at, um, this is another key assessment area that you need to know. Um, and it's, a, it's basically through inspection, but we're looking for clubbing. So clubbing is associated with... Um, uh, basically a chronic state of uh, reduced oxygenation essentially and I'll talk about that in a minute but your normal nail should have you know this normal angle right here of like right around 160 well with clubbing they're gonna have greater than then it's usually like a 180 degree um, I'll show you other images on the next page but you're you're gonna assess um, for clubbing on you know the individual's fingers essentially and it's always affects the tips of the fingers by their nails like this so they almost have this rounded, almost like a bulb type appearance to the fingers at the end, and then you're going to have this odd angle. So when you push your fingernails together, or if you were to hold your thumbs together like this, the tip should touch. Well, if, if it's clubbed, you're not going to have that touching. They're going to have an open angle here. Um, and I think it's in another lecture that I have. I, there's a lot of other images of clubbing essentially in there. So when you go through them, you'll see it. The other assessment area that you need to know is, is checking capillary refill. Um, this essentially is, once again, looking for oxygenation, and this is more of an acute thing. Um, so this is done through palpation. And, um, well, before I go to this, but you should also palpate the nails, making sure that they're smooth and firm. You know, that's another thing you're just looking at. Um, but capillary refill, what you're doing is you're essentially, all you're doing is squeezing or, or pressing the um, individual's finger like this until it blanches, like you'll get that white blanching if you were to press in the patient's finger. 
if and then you release so you're gonna blanch you know you're squeezing kind of not hard but I mean hard enough that you're blanching the skin then you release and then you're gonna observe for that um, return to um, baseline or return to pink or you know that pink tissue again so you're gonna look at the speed of it essentially it should be it should be less than three seconds so you squeeze release and then you know basically if, if it stays white for 10 15 seconds that's an indicator that there's something going on potentially with, um, you know, perfusion there. And it's not always um, a central cause because when you start looking at central cyanosis versus peripheral, like things like Raynaud's um, can cause um, peripheral skin changes like that. So it doesn't necessarily always mean that there's an issue going on like with the heart, but, you know, it's something you always got to keep in the back of your mind. So capillary refill is one of those um, nursing skills that you need to know. In terms of documentation, so when you document, you're basically going to write, you know, skin is warm, dry, consistent, dark brown color, or consistent pink color throughout. Um, skin it has elastic turgor, no odor, and no lesions noted. And then for hair, hair is clean, thick, soft, straight, evenly distributed. So you're just describing it essentially. Scalp is clean, dry, and free of lesions. Nerves, uh, nails are curved, firm, and pink. Nail beds are pink with immediate capillary refill. So or you can even put capillary refill less than three seconds. That's typically what I would always put. So this would be for normals. If you have any other questions, please let me know. Thanks.